Revenge, written and read by John Cattage. It was just a small scar, barely more than an inch in length, but on the left cheek of an 18-year-old girl, it meant the difference between seeing herself as attractive or plain ugly. Joanne surveyed the half dozen stitches in the bedroom mirror as the tears scampered down her cheeks, running freely on the right side, but caught up in the ploughed field that represented her new face on the left. She ran her forefinger along the black cotton. The nurse had done her best and assured her that whilst the cut was deep, the final result wouldn't look too bad. But of course, not too bad wasn't right and never would be. She hadn't any intention of going out last night. With her A-levels a month away, she needed every minute to study if she was to achieve her dream of becoming a pharmacist. She was enjoying a 10-minute break when Louise called, and Louise was nothing if not insistent. Come on, you can't study every night, Joe. We all need a break. Come to the pub for an hour or so. It's Friday, and I don't want to go on my own some. I don't know, Lou. I'm not really feeling it. Come on, Joe, that Rob from the bike shop will be there. You know, the one you fancy. He's always out on a Friday. I, I, oh, go on then. Only an hour, mind. Of course, an hour became two and then three, and there was no sign of Rob. Just the coffin dodging, Toby jug-faced regulars, love-struck couples, sad lonesomes, and a cluster of rowdy student types. Joanne felt a tad tipsy as she lurched towards the ladies just before closing time and failed to notice the jutting out size 12 booter student. She slipped, upended the table and sent their drinks cascading across the floor, a liquid amalgam of wasted alcohol. A couple of students laughed, but one, a particularly raucous raven-head female, failed to see the funny side. You stupid bitch. Watch where you're going, you pisshead. Jennifer stumbled to her feet, jeans drenched. I'm sorry, I slipped over someone's foot. I'll buy replacements now. Mr. Size 12, slightly the right side of Sobo, was fine. Yeah, leave it out, Bex. No probs, love. No damage done. However, Bex, well the worst for wear, was in no mood for reconciliation. You can pay to clean our bloody wet clothes too, you stupid cow. Look, there's no need to be awkward. It was an accident. Accident, my ass. I'll give you accident, you dopey slag. It all happened in an instant, and the pain didn't register for several seconds. The thrust of jagged glass, spurting warmth of coppery blood, Panic as the students grabbed their belongings and rushed to the exit, hurling the boost at Bex as they sprinted into the night. Hearing the commotion, Louise rushed over, reaching Joanne at the same time as the barman. What the hell's going on, Joe? Oh my God, what's happened to your face? Quick, someone, phone for an ambulance. They never caught Bex, though the police insisted they tried all avenues. The students weren't local, probably in town overnight, and scarping back out as soon as the brown stuff hit the fan. Louise hadn't got a good look and the barman claimed he never remembered faces. The Toby joke gave a collective prune face shake of their heads. Joanne was the only one who would never forget what Bex looked like. Her confidence was shattered. She flunked her exams, feared leaving the house, gave up on her pharmacist dreams. And even though some semblance of confidence eventually returned, ended up as a job flittering, twice to force shell of the successful and prosperous woman she should have become. Forty years later, fast approaching her sixtieth candle, a restless Joanne slipped a skinny latte in her favourite local cafe as she ran her well-manicured forefinger along the scar. What if Mike didn't turn up? What if he was nothing like his profile? Several friends had warned her of the dangers of online dating after being caught out. Angie in particular was adamant that no good would come of it. They're literally after one thing, Joe, and they'll tell you any old lie. And don't get me started on their profiles. The last one's photo must have been taken in school. (sighs) I may as well go through with it now I've got this far, Ange. Anyway, it's a busy cafe in broad daylight. I'll be fine. Ah, you say that, but they literally have thousands of ways of luring you away. They're professionals at it. Don't worry, Ange, I'll be extra careful. The cafe door opened and there he was, instantly recognisable, smartly dressed and carrying a bunch of roses. He smiled, held out his hands and leant forward, kissing her lightly on the damaged cheek. Joe felt her heart flutter as Mike sat down and ordered two fresh lattes. An hour passed in a blur. Despite Angie's misgivings, Mike was fine. 
good looking, easy going and genuine. All a woman could expect, especially one who had suffered the agony of a matching pair of painful divorces. Mike had placed his hand on Joanne's and they were discussing when to meet again when the door opened and a pair of late middle-aged women entered the cafe. Joe was oblivious, but as they sat down, something in one of the ladies' voices struck her like a glass in the face. She felt herself recoil as she glanced at the woman. Her hair was no longer raven, now snow white, but the raucous, grating voice was all too familiar. As the panic hit, Joanne rose from the table. Sorry, Mike, I have to go. What? Why? Have I said something wrong? No, it's not you. Look, I'll be in touch, honest. I've got to leave now. She hurried out, leaving a stand mic to settle a bill. At the street corner, she stopped and desperately tried to catch her breath. Hidden behind a conveniently placed van, she watched as Mike left the cafe, shaking his head. He looked up and down the street, then reaching for his phone, began dialing. Joanne hit the reject button. His shoulders slouched off, he made off in the opposite direction. It was another 20 minutes before the women appeared. Joanne pinched her coat collar tighter and began to follow as they passed by, no more than 10 yards away. It was a good half mile before they split up, air kisses and raucous laughter in abundance. Joe followed her quarry as she entered the multi-story, feeling in her handbag for the knife, the one she carried permanently and had honed every Saturday morning for the past four decades. As the woman opened her car door, Joe caught up. Wait a moment, love, I've got something for you. She turned and actually smiled. Not for long, just a fleeting moment. She wasn't smiling as Joanne caught hold of her shoulder and deftly slit her left cheek. That's what you get for ruining my life. Who's the stupid bitch now, Bex? Joanne didn't wait for a response. Ignoring the scream, she scampered from the car park to the sanctuary of her beloved Fiat 500. Her thudding heartbeat returned to something close to normal when she reached home and poured herself a generous whiskey on the rocks. She raised her glass. Gotcha, you dopey slag. The police came knocking two days later. 40 years ago, they hadn't been able to utilise the enormous benefits of CCTV. Now it was so much easier to trace a criminal. Joanne was swiftly arrested, handcuffed and escorted to the local Nick. The hard-faced CID officers listened intently as she detailed why she'd done it, but they were less than sympathetic. It was the DS who put her out of her misery. You've only got one problem, Joe. You got the wrong woman. We've investigated, and the lady you knifed was the younger sister of the girl who glassed you. Bex died 20 years ago. You knife Rachel, very similar in looks apparently, but a decent, innocent woman enjoying a shopping trip here with an old friend. Joe ran a well-manicured forefinger down the scar on her left cheek, hung her head in her hands, and silently prayed for a sympathetic judge and jury. Mm -hmm.